Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger for thousands of appetizing ingredients that inspire countless mouthwatering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices. Plus, extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. This episode is brought to you by Microsoft Azure. Turn your ideas into reality with an Azure free account. Get everything you need to develop apps across cloud and hybrid environments, scale workloads, create cloud-connected mobile experiences, and so much more. Discover what you can create with popular services free for 12 months. Learn more at azure.com. That's A-Z-U-R-E dot com. And sign up for a free account to start building in the cloud today. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to the Daily Red, your lunchtime catch-up on all things Liverpool FC on a Monday where the Reds are top of the league. Liverpool 2, Wolves 1 at the weekend. Not a particularly good performance by Liverpool, but a win nonetheless, and that is what's most important. Anytime you go away in the Premier League and win a game of football, it's a good result. And anytime you play badly and win away from home, it's a really good result. And it's becoming a bit of a habit for us to go away and win, which is really, really nice. Um, We have won all of our away games so far this season, and that's a trend that would be very beneficial to us if it continues. Now, obviously, we have had a pretty light schedule so far. I think if you'd looked at our fixtures before the season you probably would have said 15 points if Jurgen was in charge what's impressive is that we've done with the managerial check that's where the the impressive nature of this comes in you know we've played Ipswich we've played Brentford we've played Manchester United played Nottingham Forest we've played Bournemouth and we've now played Wolves and if we take a look at the Premier League table and how it stands at the moment You've got Ipswich currently sitting in 15th. So obviously things aren't going great for them, but they'll be happy enough, I think, with with four draws on the bounce uh, since losing to Ulster City in the opening games. Brentford are currently 11th. Their season has taken a bit of a dip in recent weeks after a pretty good start that was interrupted by us beating them. Manchester United, they currently sit 12th, which isn't ideal for them and not ideal for those of us that want to see Eric Ten Hag stay United as long as possible Uh, Nottingham Forest they are currently in 10 they lost for the first time at the weekend they obviously beat us Bournemouth are in 13th they've now lost back to back games and then last but not least Wolves who sit dead bottom of the league So we haven't beaten anybody that's currently in the top half and the only top half team we've played beat us at Anfield. It's been a really easy run. There's much tougher games to come. But up next is Crystal Palace. And at the moment, they're in 18th. They've only taken three points this season. They're yet to win this season. Now, it is a 12.30 kickoff, which 
does favour them, obviously, with it being in London. But we will go into that game expecting to win. Then it gets tougher. Then it's Chelsea home. Chelsea are currently four. They're not very good defensively. They really aren't very good defensively. They were wide open at the weekend in that Brighton game. And if not for Brighton gifting them three goals, really, including the the penalty, Chelsea could easily have lost that game. Now, likewise, they gifted Brighton their goals because they're not good defensively. That at Anfield is a game we should win. But we're going to have to tighten up significantly in midfield because we're far too easy to play through. Wolves played through us quite easily a number of times, including for their goal. And that's a major concern. And while people are loading players, they're not looking at the overall picture of how the game is played. They're only looking at the on-ball stuff and not the off-ball stuff. And that goes throughout the team. Then we play Arsenal away. And that's obviously going to be one of the toughest games of the season. They are currently in third. They're unbeaten. Four wins, two draws. A little bit fortunate at the weekend, but they did batter Leicester. But it was just fortunate the way the win came about with their third goal being an own goal to put them ahead in stoppage time. Um, After that then... We play Brighton at home and Villa at home. And they're two tough games. Now, Brighton, they're a bit of a mixed bag. They've only lost once this season. That was to Chelsea. They haven't won in four. They don't look great defensively. Their centre-backs are really, really poor. Um, He hasn't figured out the balance in midfield yet. Hers in here. But... There's a lot of talent in that team. And we know Villa are a really good team. Villa are fifth, level on points with Chelsea. But their defence has been rocky this season. And they draw at Ipswich at the weekend. They've lost to Arsenal, a game they should have won. They should have won at the weekend. They'll be happy enough with how things are going. But they will be disappointed with the, the Ipswich result because they'll have expected to go there and win. So the next run of games is much, much tougher than what we've just been through. And the sixth game in the run is away to Southampton, which should be a win. So you're looking at Palace and Southampton away, bookending a run of four good to very good teams that we'll take on. Chelsea are a good team. Arsenal are very good. Brighton are good. And Villa are very good. And that's going to be the test of this Liverpool team. Coming out of that, that's when we'll know what this team is made of. That'll be 12 games in. That'll be a decent sample size for us to look at. Now, the next six after that also contains some really tough games with City at home, Newcastle away, Everton away, Spurs away. But there's some very winnable games in there as well with Fulham home and uh, and Leicester home. That'll get us through 18. And then we'll really know what we're made of. We'll really know if this team is capable of competing for the Premier League title. And at that point, we'll also be past Christmas and approaching New Year and approaching the transfer window up. And we'll see then what they do to address the flaws in the team. We look pretty good going forward a lot of the time. There's some really nice patterns of play. There's some really impressive individual play. But then there's also been some very questionable decision-making by a couple of players, notably Salah at times, which is unusual for him, and Zabozlai. And Zabozlai is getting a lot of criticism after the game at the weekend because his on-ball performance was not good. But his off-ball performance was good. He is comfortably our best presser. He's also the best we have as a defensive midfielder in terms of breaking up opposition play. Gravenberg is very good at interceptions because he's big, he's long, and he just tends to be able to stretch a foot out. McAllister's the best positionally, but he doesn't have the mobility. So Bosley has the best combination of the two. The issue is... When one gets drawn out of position, 
another tends to go and try and fill that position. And the chain starts to break down a little bit. And we saw it with the Wolves goal, where Lamina knocks it by Gravenberg. And you're looking at it and you're thinking, okay, well, he knocks it by Sabozle, rather. And you're looking at it and thinking, well, Gravenberg's just going to step in, pick that ball up. Because Lamina's knocked it quite far ahead of himself. And there's no Liverpool player gets anywhere close to it. And you're wondering where our six is, and he's actually gone beyond the ten. Because he's an eight. And his instincts are to play as an eight. And all his good actions are those of an eight. And his ball carrying is that of an eight. And he's doing that really well. But that's not the role. And that's why they were so keen to get Azubamendi in in the summer. It's, pro- it's why they'll probably revisit that position in January to look to address the significant flaw that we have defensively in our midfield. Like I said, on ball, we look pretty good. There's still a lack of central progression. We're still struggling to break things down through the middle, which is a big part of what Arne Slot used to do when he was at Feyenoord, was break the lines through the middle, collapse the defence centrally, spring it wide, and then you're into space and then you can create easier chances. And we saw us do it a little bit in pre-season, but obviously pre-season is not too much of a tell because a lot of teams aren't playing at 100%. But that's all stuff that can improve. And it's obviously, we're six games in, eight if you include the Champions League and, and League Cup. It's a very small amount of games. It's a very short amount of time that Arne Slot has had with this group of players. So he's not going to overload them with information. He's not going to overload them with ideas. He's not going to overload them with, with tactical changes from what they've been doing under Jurgen. He's not walked in the door and said, right, forget everything you know. This is how we're playing from now on. He's tried to bridge the gap from what Jürgen had them doing to what he wants them doing. And that's going to be a process. That's going to take maybe two years because it's a drastic difference. And he'll implement bit by bit by bit. And we won't notice an extreme change. We've already seen quite a change, but we won't notice how extreme the change is by the time he's finished because he'll have done it gradually. I thought against Wolves, the two centre-backs were outrageously good. Now, Ibu, obviously, there's a mistake for their goal. The more I watch it, the more I think it's Alisson's fault. And then the more I think about it, the more I think it's Alisson's fault because he's had those type of communication issues with Virgil in the past, with Joe Gomez in the past, with Joel Matip in the past. So while Ibu, Ibu should just deal with it like he should just deal with it I do think there's a he's expecting Allison to come and deal with it and Ali did seem to mount to him afterwards that's my bad that's my bad but he was also saying just get rid of it so I don't really know but both centre backs have been incredible this season and they've needed to be like they have needed to be we're not giving up a lot of big chances primarily because of those two It's not because our midfield is stopping teams, because they're not. It's because of those two at centre-back. They've been phenomenal since Ibu came on at Ipswich. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, for thousands of appetising ingredients that inspire countless mouth-watering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Throw the best birthday party ever that your child will always talk about. Big Air Trampoline Park inside Fieldhouse USA at the Polaris Mall can do just that. Award-winning birthday party packages start at just $300, and all birthday parties include pizza, drinks, a party room with a party host, grip socks, printed invitations, and all 40 attractions at Big Air Trampoline Park. It's a birthday party you and your kids will never forget. Book your party today. Big Air Columbus, where the fun never ends. Visit BigAirUSA.com slash Columbus for details. 
Are you ready to take your business to the next level? Meet Viant AI, the world's first fully autonomous advertising platform. With Viant AI, you can automate media planning, analyze results, and drive smarter decisions, all while saving you time and resources. Viant AI helps you unlock new potential and boost productivity, regardless of your expertise. Visit Viant.ai today and see how the future of artificial intelligence in advertising can work for you. And that's the best pairing in the league by a country mile. We've only conceded two goals, and it is because of those two. It does help, obviously, having the best keeper in the world as well. It helps that Trent has rediscovered his desire to defend. I think he's defended pretty well all season, much better than last year or the year before. Cunha caused him some problems. Cunha's going to cause every single defence he comes up against a ton of problems because he's a really, really good footballer. He's one you could see playing for a team like us. Their midfield was very combative as well, and that caused us some issues. We didn't seem to cope well with the physicality of their midfield, but they ran the legs off themselves. And once their legs started to go, that's when our midfield started to look a bit better. But they didn't look good at all in the first half. None of them. Second half, it was a bit of an improvement. Not really sure where Gravenberg Man of the Match came from, considering how good the two centre-backs were. They were a clear level above everybody else. But it is what it is. Um, it's good for his confidence. It's, it's good for his morale. It'll keep him locked in. It'll keep him believing in what he's doing. It'll keep him playing a physical brand of football. And that's a really good thing. Mo had a weird game. Mo had a really weird game. There was moments where he looked good. There was moments where he looked poor. There was moments where he was clearly very frustrated with how the game was been officiated. You had Ryan Ed Nuri at times attempting to climb inside Mo's jersey. This is our jersey now, Mo. We're going to share this one. And I still just can't get over that moment in the second half where the ball is played up to Mo. He is being wrestled by Aiden Uri. Like wrestled. Like some sort of Greco-Roman judo hybrid type of, of grappling. And Mo manages to shake him off and Aiden Uri falls over. And the reason Aiden Uri fell over is because he was leveraging his weight onto Mo. And when Mo managed to break free and the weight wasn't there to lean in on, Aiden Uri fell over. And the referee gave them a free kick. It's a staggering thing. And I saw this. Parted Beard sent me this on uh, on Twitter the other day. Was it yesterday, maybe? Uh, let me see if I can find this. Parted Beard. Here we go. This is this is mental. Like This might be the strangest thing that you're ever going to hear. Number of fouls committed this season in the Premier League, right? So you've got Trent on two, Virgil on three, Luis Diaz on four. You've got United's Gnome on five, Gabriel of, of Arsenal on five. Canate has five, Mark Kukurea has six, William Saliba has eight. And Mo Salah has eight. Eight free kicks have been given against him this year. How? Like, he doesn't tackle people. But how are free kicks being given against him? Because he's trying to fight off people that are trying to pull his jersey off. And I know he's always good against Mo at Molyneux. Always. You go back a couple of years, we beat them with a late goal, I think by Divock. It was after I knew he'd gone off. He'd been unbelievable up until that point. But the reason he's really good it's because he gets a very favourable whistle there. Because he's very physical with Mo. He gets right up against Mo and he gets hold of Mo. And even if it's not like a grab, he gets his arm in under Mo's arm and holds him and doesn't let him away. And because he's got quick feet and because he's young and he's agile, he can move with Mo. 
and referees let him away with. Most defenders stand off Mo a little bit because they're worried about getting spun. He doesn't because he's not worried about getting spun because he's got a hold of Mo. So Mo can't spin him. And referees are seeing this and they're not giving free kicks. They're giving free kicks against Mo, which is just a very, very strange thing. Uh, Diogo Jota might have a contender for cross of the season. I think for the Ebro goal, it's an absolute peach of a cross to dig out on the move. A uh, great header, obviously, by Ebro that put us one up. And then obviously Jota won the penalty for the uh, the winner as well, which I, I still don't know what Semedo's doing. Your team have just gotten back level and you're doing something that stupid. On a ball that realistically Jota's probably not getting. But it is what it is. That's what he decided to do. Jota didn't really have a good game, but he did have those two involvements, which, you know, ultimately proved very, very important. Back to Sabal's life. It's a funny thing. If he scores that chance that Johnston saves, we don't hear a single word about his performance in a negative light. Not a word. He wouldn't have played any different. He wouldn't have done anything any different. But he wouldn't have been slated for his performance. Wouldn't have been slated at all for his performance. But because he didn't score, people take more of a harsh view. People take more of a harsh view because people judge on-ball stuff and aesthetics more than off-ball stuff and fundamentals. Now, he does need to improve on that performance, but this idea that he's he's been poor this season is just not rooted in any kind of reality. Like, if you look through our games, he was good against Ipswich, he was good against Brentford, he was really good against United. He was awful against Forrest. Everyone was awful against Forrest, bar the two centre-backs at Ali. He was good against Bournemouth. He was good against Milan. And he was poor against Wolves. Most of the team was poor against Wolves. But yet he seems to get the brunt of it. Now part of that is because he cost a lot of money. He came with a big reputation. He's an immensely talented footballer who at times makes things look very easy. But what people are ignoring is the job he's doing for us off the ball and how important that is. He's being very harshly judged and his good performances are being completely ignored while his bad performances are being massively over over hike and it's funny because other players in the team who've also had multiple bad games are getting loaded and talked about as if they're having nine and ten out of tens each week when in truth they're putting in seven out of tens most weeks because that's all we need them to do but it seems like if Sabal's light doesn't turn in an eight or nine every single week then it's not good enough for certain people because there's this weird double standard among football fans and how they judge different levels of players. They have high expectations for one, and if that player doesn't meet the expectations that they've, they've set, nobody else has set them, just them themselves, then they're not good enough. Other players, there's really low expectations for, so if they perform slightly above those expectations, well, they must have been brilliant because they hold them to different expectations and therefore rate them differently based on how they perform. So if you have an expectation of one player to give you a 9 out of 10 and they give you an 8 out of 10, they've fallen short of your expectations. If you expect a 5 out of 10 and they give you a 6 or a 7, they've exceeded your expectations and now you're going to talk them up. It's a very strange thing. And recency bias is also a massive thing. Massive. And again, Sabazlai is a prime example of that. And Mo has been a prime example of that this season. People talk about Mo being washed, despite the fact he's now got nine goal contributions already this season, which is 
pretty spectacular pace for a fella who's allegedly washed. Like I've seen people say Harvey Elliott should be starting if he was fit. Do you understand what a defensive liability we would have in midfield with an Elliott, Alexis, Gravenberg midfield three? And it doesn't come close to making up for it on the ball. Balance is key. And right now the midfield balance is working. Against the teams we've played, the midfield balance is working. Because they all do different things and it complements each other. And yes, we're not getting enough from Sabozlai on the ball. But Gravenberg makes up for that with his carrying, with some of his passing. Alexis makes up for that with his passing and decision making. We don't get enough from those two off the ball. But Sabozlai makes up for that with his energy and his intensity. So the midfield as a three is working well. But there are much bigger tests to come. Bologna will be an interesting game in the week. We'll talk about that more as the uh, the game gets closer. I actually won't be here um, tomorrow and probably not Wednesday or Thursday. But Guy Drinkle will fill in and I'm sure will do a more than adequate job at keeping you updated. We are recording a scouted for Bologna later today. Um, Anfitindex.com, there's a piece about Mo. There is uh, some analysis on our win over Wolves. There is a piece about Virgil. There is a piece about Ben Doak and how he's getting on on loan. There's a piece about Arna and the the start that we've made. And then podcast-wise, there is the David Lynch podcast from over the weekend. There is post-match role. There is the final whistle pod with Nina and Ben. And then there is today's... um, Media Matters, which is obviously Dave Davis and David Lynch discussing the Wolves game and how things are going thus far. Other pods this week, um, like I said, there'll be a scouted today. There is a red alert for September, which is coming out today. On Tuesday, we will have a press conference pod and a... I assume the post-press conference pod as well. There'll also be an under pressure. There's Raw on Wednesday night. I'm not sure who it is with myself and Trev. I know it's me and Trev. I don't know who the third person is. On Thursday, there will be Stat Me Up, and there's a Pro Plus that Eddie is doing. Um, There is a press conference pod on Friday. There'll be a couple of other bits and pieces there as well. And then obviously there'll be Raw on Saturday. Right, that's it for me. I will see you all on Friday. I might be back Wednesday. But Tuesday, Thursday, definitely out. Wednesday's up in the air. I'll just say see you Friday, just in case. Take care. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed listening to this Anfield Index show. Please be sure to subscribe to our channel so future podcasts find their way to your device automatically. There's nothing quite like fan engagement. And we'd love to know what you think of anything discussed on this show. The best way to get in touch is over on our free Discord community, where both podcasters and listeners debate the hottest LFC topics 24-7. Sign up free now at anfieldindex.com forward slash discord. You won't regret it. You can also follow us on Twitter at Anfield Index and find us on Facebook by searching for Anfield Index. Oh, and before you go, We'd love it if you could leave us a five-star review on your favourite podcast app. It only takes a couple of seconds, and it means the world to the people who create these free shows. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.